Welcome to the 5 W's podcast. What works for who, in what context and why. The podcast is a form of knowledge exchange for my current doctoral studies at Leeds Beckett University where I'm exploring a biopsychosocial approach to athlete development. The conversation seeks to gain perspective from a wide range of practitioners, namely academia, athletes, coaches, psychologists and sports scientists. I hope you enjoy the show. Often when discussing sport you will hear the word process. How can a process influence performance? How can you use a process to achieve a level of consistency within performance? What daily habits can we put in place to transfer what we do in the gym or the training paddock into the performance arena? What theories, concepts and knowledge exist to aid in the applied setting? That is what we will be discussing today. Hugh Gilmore, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for taking the time to discuss the topic we're going to go through today. Uh, one, because I know you're in demand through your own practice um, as a psychologist and guest lecturer, but probably more importantly, you've just become a father for the first time. Is that right? Yeah, I have. Um, you get nine months to prepare for it and you still do a bad job. <laughs> um, so it's, it's one of those things that you don't you don't expect coming. Um, but yes, slightly sleep deprived, and um, if I'm a bit waffly today or a bit uh, I say something wrong, the listeners should definitely question that. <laughs> and uh, just I suppose you should do that with anybody you, you interview. Is actually always question to see uh, are they talking nonsense or not. Never take something for granted. But yeah, especially if they're sleep deprived. So yeah, word of warning. That's a very good point about uh, taking things with a pinch of salt. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm well aware time is probably very precious to you right now. So I, I do appreciate uh, you giving some up to, to talk to me today. So before we get into the kind of main topic, uh, would you be so kind just to kind of give a little biography, your background, your current role, any information that you feel appropriate and certainly you know, social media and your own podcast, if you feel that's appropriate. Um, well, I suppose I'm the co-host of the 80% Mental podcast with Dr. Pete Ola Sugar, um, and that's been quite a success. It's a, it's a niche podcast because it's all about performance psychology, and we've got some amazing guests on and interviewed them. Um, and it's, you know, well, it's, it's done very, very well. So it has actually, we've got interviewed by the BPS and it's an approved BSE's resource now. So, uh, yeah, we're pretty happy with that. But uh, my actual job, because none of that is paid, uh, as, as I'm sure you know, Kevin, um, is um, sports psych with British weightlifting, working with the Paralympic powerlifting team and with British Athletics, um, working with their world-class programme and their pathway. Um, and then I do a few other bits and pieces as well. I'm a motivational interviewing trainer, and uh, yeah, so that's 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 my current role. But um, I mean, previously I've been a coach in the GAA in the sport of hurling since I was 16, and then an Olympic weightlifting coach uh, at 27, and I actually became a tutor um, in both of those sports. Um, so I have a long history of being a coach, educator, and a tutor across those two sports and uh, I also even sat on the board of directors once for Netball in Northern Ireland for a couple of years uh, and I did wear a skirt once but that was long uh, ago and that was for a charity game with Netball just to clarify that so yeah that's that's a, that's the short version of my uh, biography. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a deeper and better story to that skirt scenario uh, but we'll, we'll leave that for the, for the time being. Um, so one of the, the, the objectives for me on the podcast is to try and assist coaches, sports scientists, S&C, with kind of strategies, frameworks or experiences that they can take away themselves and kind of use within their own context. And I think what you're going to provide today is going to be very valuable in that context. So for me, 
as an SNC coach, one of the aspects of performance I reflect upon is how can I transfer what we do in the gym or on field conditioning or wherever we do in the, the SNC session is how can I transfer that to a game day performance? How can I make sure what we're doing in our session transfers to a Saturday? So for example, and one possible strategy that people might have heard of or might be aware of is anchoring. Is that a correct statement? Is is that something that's used widely or is it something slightly different? Can you give us a little introduction if that's the correct statement uh, and how that might impact performance? Yeah, so I, um, I've i heard of anchoring um, and it's one of those things, it's, it's like a nice word, isn't it? You know, anchoring, um, because like everyone knows what an anchor is and then it, it has this kind of a... Uh, Familiarity, familiarity here because you know what an anchor is and you can understand it. You kind of think, well, well, it's an anchor. It's holding me down. Technique actually uh, comes from neuro linguistic programming, and there's great meta analysis for those of us who uh, like to read um, research by Thomas. Wojcicki um, in the Polish Psychological Bulletin 20, 2010 and it's called 35 Years of State of the Art or Pseudoscientific Declaration and his meta-analysis essentially looks at the uh, failure of NLP to, be, NLP to be replicated in an evidence base and there's also like a, a number of other um, interesting things about the creators of that and you can look into their history they were more like con men than uh, they were allegedly um so just <laughs> legal but you can look in i think there's a number of um criminal situations uh, to a great extent with the original creators of that um so it was a therapy that kind of emerged out of palo alto can't believe I know all this. Um, but yeah, it was a therapy that emerged at Palo Alto in America, um, where other therapies have emerged from. But it was much less evidence-based, and it was kind of like a mishmash of therapies. So that's where the original technique came from. And if you then think of, like, what are they basing that on? They actually based that on uh, Pavlov's dog, you know, the, the saliva and the yeah, veil. Yeah, yeah, So the idea being that... that for those of you who don't know Pavlov's dog, it's one of those seminal studies in psychology. Um, and the, the purpose of it was that when Pavlov fed his dogs, the dogs would hear a bell, and then the dogs became conditioned to think, oh, I've heard the bell, therefore I'm getting fed and I know food's coming. And then what Pavlov found is that he could actually increase the rate at which they salivate, um, produce saliva, by just ringing the bell. So they, they have been conditioned to think, oh, the bell means food's coming, therefore they react physiologically to the bell now instead of the stimulus of food. Um, so that's actually what anchoring is based on, is this idea that, you know, oh, we can anchor uh, a thought or a feeling that, to, to a stimulus. So the, the technique, as I understand it, is that you experience a memory or a experience an emotion, a feeling, a thing that you want, and then you create a physical sensation. People say like you push your, your thumb and forefinger together to create that feeling. They go, right, now I feel that. Um, and then you associate that feeling with the other feeling and try and connect the two. And I think, you know, that's, that's interesting that I can go and say, right, I want to feel like I felt during that game when it was really, really good. And I'm going to remember that game and, and pinch my finger and thumb together and create a feeling and associate with that feeling with that that thing. And that sounds like, you know, it might be useful, but I think the level of stimulus that Pavlov used was actual food. And food is obviously a, a big stimulus from, from a bio, biological point of view. It's very important. And it's an experience that someone experiences every time. Um you know, when, when they have the food, like, it's a repetitive experience. So it's a strong stimulus. And then associating a the bell with that is, is you know, probably going to work. But I don't think there's enough evidence to support like the, the pinching 
of yourself or a fit, doing a physical action to create an anchor into a past memory to re-experience that uh, experience on call is much, you know what, there's, much, there's not much evidence in it, but there's also much more better things that can, that can be used in psychology. Um, and it's interesting as well because, you know, past, past experiences of success and good feelings are really uh, a big part of confidence. Um, so, like, there is value in thinking about past success and drawing back on that as a well of resource. But I think, you know, using it as a here's my superpower type thing, I'll just do this, remember that, and then everything will be all right is rather too simplistic and not really that evidence-based. There's also things like pre-performance routines as well, which are probably much more aligned to that um, kind of a thing. But I think that that's the thing. I've just mentioned confidence. Well, from, from a psychology point of view, it would be called self-efficacy. Self-efficacy sounds like what? And pre-performance routine sounds like what? But anchoring? Oh, yeah. That, that's catchy, if you know what I mean. That, that familiarity, it's based on language that people know. So therefore, that catches on because it's popular. It's like it's better marketed because it uses words that humans actually understand, which is a great lesson for any coach uh, or you know, just anybody who's got an academic background is like, how do you make your your science sound like something, you know, the local coach with no degree would understand? Um, so I think that's that's a good lesson to take out of, you know, poorly evidence-based things like NLP. Uh, I don't know, Kevin, um, have you any thoughts on that? What do you think? Uh, have I said anything there that you may maybe want to challenge or disagree on? No, I, I think you are right, and the more I kind of go down my academic journey and, and the more I learn, vocabulary terminology is key to anything that you understand or, or try and pass over. You know, So this podcast is about a biopsychosocial approach to athlete development. Would I use the term bi- biopsychosocial with my athletes? Probably not. So again, you know that, that language... And terminology you use is very important. And I think in, in academia, we, we certainly get caught up in that, don't we, those definitions, and this is what I'm about. And as you've said, if it's catchy and it sells, definitely I'm, I'm, I'm all in. Um, so thanks for clarifying the, the anchoring scenario. So you talked about pre-performance routines and self-efficacy, and, and self-efficacy is a word that I do use a lot. So... Are, are those terms kind of grounded in academic theory or are they cognitive biases or the heuristics? Can you can you talk about that? Yeah, so what's interesting is that uh, you mentioned about cognitive biases and heuristics. I didn't actually realise this um, until I was coming on the show. Um, but the anchoring is also... Um, a cognitive bias and you might think well that's a bit strange that a psychologist doesn't know um, the term for or, uh, uh, doesn't know a uh, cognitive bias and that's because there's like over 135 of them uh, as well as them having them, their own um, pet names like anchoring that's actually called focalism um, where somebody focus, focuses on one piece of information to make their decision so like again you've got this idea whereby We've got one thing called anchoring from, you know, a non-evidence-based approach like NLP. And then another thing of like, we've got um, a cognitive bias called anchoring. And you're like, well, which one's which? And how do you know you're talking about which one? And that's a really interesting thing because in psychology, psychology has got a real problem called the jingle jangle fallacy, which is where some of the research is actually based off of things with the same name or the, so I'll explain that better so we can say that the jingle jangle fallacy means that you have actually created a new construct but called it an old name and therefore it sounds as if uh, you know oh this is this is the same thing but it's actually completely not or the opposite of it is where somebody has created uh, the same construct and given it um, a new name so and you can, you can Google jingle jangle fallacy for more on this, but a perfect example is a grit. Um, people talk about grit being, oh, we need grit. But actually, 
there's again an, a study out which which exposes grit as just relabeled conscientiousness um, and it's pretty much maps one for one over the construct of conscientiousness so if these things are the same thing and measuring the same thing but with different names that's just a market employee for academics so that they have a niche because they've given a new name um, so I think again it's one of the failures in psychology whereas if we look at s and c um, you know, if somebody says, okay, we've got um, rate of force development, it's, it's de- we, we can really see what that is. We can measure it. We, we know exactly what it is. Where psychological constructs are more vague, so there's less, less uh, I suppose, less um, opportunity for people to mislabel and do things like that because S and C is such a, 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 what's the word? A tangible thing Mm -hmm. um you know even if you look at one of my pet peeves in 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 strength and conditioning is when people talk about having explosive strength and i think well that's that must be very useful to terrorists you know (laughs) um if if you can just magically blow up your muscles um (laughs) but 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 like you know it's it's rate of force development um as opposed to explosive strength but you know that that's just Sorry for the poor jokes, but you know you, the point I want to make is that what is the actual term is important. So to go back to your confidence and self-efficacy, confidence is is foundational within psychology. Um, Albert Bandura came up with that. He's one of the like the top three psychologists uh, in the world ever, um, and he came up with it with self-confidence. And self-confidence has been shown as possibly one of the biggest things that will. Uh, impact somebody's performance. So from a psychologist's perspective, if I can um, create uh, the the situation for confidence um, and, and help create confidence, that's a great impactor on, um, on, on performance. So self-efficacy is made up of a number of features which control that. Um, and the... <laughs> The, f- the biggest one of those is past success. So like, what I often say to people is, how confident are you that you can get up and, and walk from here to your car? Or if you're in a wheelchair, wheel from here to your car or wherever it is. And they say, yeah, I'm pretty confident. How confident out of, out of 10 are you? Well, 10 out of 10. And think, well, why are you that confident? Because oh, I've done it loads of, the t- loads of times before. I know where my car is. I know how to walk or I know how to use my wheelchair or whatever it is to get to that point. It's, you know, you've done it before and that's the biggest source of confidence. But then we think as coaches, how do we develop a player? We aren't giving them experiences where they've done it before. We can't go to them and say, look, can you go and win uh, Six Nations? Can you go and go to the Olympics? We have to break things down a bit. And I think this is interesting because if you look at the research of Lev Vygotsky, he talks about the zone of proximal development, and it's an old and dated theory, but I quite like it. And what that is, is basically Goldilocks. He wrote, he wrote his research around Goldilocks. And again, this is me marketing psychology for Lev. Um, I don't know him personally, I probably shouldn't call him Lev. <laughs> but, um, so Lev Vygotsky, um, he, he basically came up with a scientific theory which replaces the Goldilocks story. And Goldilocks, as you know it, like, you, you know the, the punchline from Goldilocks, don't you, Kevin? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it would be, that's just right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's it, yeah. So that's that was his research. It's like <laughs> you've got too much, you've got too little, and then you've got just right. just right. And if you think about it from a coach perspective, right, you want to put a task out there that's not too much, not too little, it's just right. It's challenging enough that they develop, but it's easy enough that they have confidence that they can do it. And then, and then once they've done that, you add in another one that's just a little bit further. So you've got this zone of proximal development where it's close to you, where you can develop. It's not too far away that you're scared, and it's not too close that you're bored. And that was Lev Vygotsky's research. He turned Goldilocks into psychological theory. But I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm I want to make make it uh, clear then when it comes to the, you know psychology or sorry when it comes to um, self efficacy or confidence, you know you're looking at those past um, past experiences or things where you've done a good job before 
and that will give you confidence. And if not, things then like or similar to what you're trying to do. So previous performance outcomes. The other features of it are uh, vicarious experiences. So vicarious experiences, again, another term we can't market, but like, can your mates do it? Does somebody you know who you can relate to, can they do it? That's the, what, another feature that Bandura found. So if, for example, you know, uh, you're from, up, where about you from, Kev? You're from up north? Uh, County Durham would be the geographical term most people uh, would County need Durham. to understand. Yeah. yeah. Lovely, lovely big cathedral there, or churches, I can't remember, but I remember being in Durham before. Um, it's quite quite picturesque. Um, but, you know, if somebody who's, you know, two streets over from you goes off and, and plays rugby for a big team, and then somebody another street over goes off and plays rugby for a big team, you then think, oh, yeah, those two lads did it. And, like, I went to the same school as them, and, you know, I did these things that they did. Um, maybe I could go off and play rugby for a big team. So it's, that's what vicarious experience is, is you thinking these people who are like me have done this, therefore I can do this. You know, I don't I don't think I can run a marathon, but I bet you every person on the top of uh, Ethiopia uh, in the Kalejian Kale- 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 tribe, I'm probably mispronouncing that wrong, but like I bet you they all think they can run a marathon because there's so many people from that, that tribe that have won marathons. You know, it, it's... It's the, what they do. So that's what vicarious experience is. is can your mates do it? Um, or who, who can you relate to that has done that? Um, and that will give you confidence. But then the other two features are verbal persuasion. And if you think about this, right, if I want to increase your confidence, what I would do as a coach is, and this is based in motivational interviewing, is I would affirm you um, and what that means is I would just state a fact um, about something that you've done. So, like, Kev, you're doing a PhD at the moment, yeah? Yes. Uh, yeah. Right. So that that's a – I don't have a PhD, but that's a, that's a massive undertaking and a big respect to you for doing that. Um, but, you know, you've uh, – can you tell me about, you know, what, what you've done in your PhD that's been a success so far or what's been, what, what's been of value to you or how it's changed you? Um, so I'll just clarify. I'm doing a professional doctorate rather than a PhD. They're still at the same level, uh, but professional doctorate mm-hmm. is looking at what I do. So I, I've currently got a role um, at Harrogate Rugby as SNC. So what am I doing there, and how can I evidence base what I do to to that level? So I'm looking at a biopsychosocial approach to athlete development. So as an s and coach, physical performance, know all about that. But actually, what are the psycho and the social drivers for physical performance? So we could look at, I've got a squad of athletes in the gym, let's say the forward pack. There's 12 athletes in the gym. What can I do for my session design to motivate them more for their physical performance? So, for example, uh, is it the Kohler effect? Have I got that right? The, uh, the German psychologist, have I got his name right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. I think so. so I'm not too sure, I can't remember what the effect is, but the name sounds familiar. Um, the effect is generally the weakest person in a group. If you have a group task and the weaker person in that group will mm-hmm. raise their performance to meet the task outcome. Um and the other version of that within sports, social loafing, where if there's a group, people kind of think other people will go, yeah. So can I design a session that will increase someone's motivation? So for example, one of my studies is going to look at, if I just make you do a session as an individual, Let's say we're going to measure, uh, we're doing velocity-based training and we're measuring meters per second that you do in a back squat. And I say, right, Hugh, you're working by yourself today, five sets, five reps, off you go. The next session you come in, I'm going to say, right, Hugh, you're going to work with Kev over in that corner. Yep, same session. Because you're now working with someone else, is that going to improve your performance? The next session you come in, 
you, you're going to work yeah. with Johnny in the corner, and you know Johnny is a lot stronger than you. So do you, again, raise your performance mm -hmm. to meet them? The next time you come in, there's a leaderboard on the, the, the wall, and you know you've got to try and get on the leaderboard. Mm -hmm. Does that improve your motivation, or do you think, I'm never getting on the leaderboard? Does it kind of... Um, do you just throw the session away because you're not that motivated? So kind of looking at those things, how I can, you know, pick up those psychosocial drivers to improve the, the physical performance. Um, you know, using velocity-based training as a feedback mechanism, does that, how does that improve motivation? So those are the things I'm looking at. Okay. And before I came in to my doctorate, I was very much velocity-based training, auto-regulation. That, that was going to be my key focus. And I'd essentially designed my studies based purely on that. But it was an exercise I was doing as, as part of a taught module where we started to critically analyse our roles. And I started to look at... Right, I, I do a lot more than just tell athletes to lift faster... I do a lot more than say, yeah, stick 10 more kilograms on that back squat and start to kind of really unpick mm -hmm. what I was doing within my role. And this led me down the path of taking a little bit of a wider view of S&C coaches. And as you spoke about before, that kind of sellability. With an S&C, a lot of people, and again, this is my own opinion, um, I'm not backed by fact or anything, but I think a lot of S&C coaches see psychology as a bit of a soft skill, that untangible that you've talked about. Mm. I can't really put my finger on it. And I'll be the first to admit, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a sociologist. I'd like to know a little bit, and the, the Dunning-Kruger effect might kick in here, where I know a little bit, and that's dangerous. But I know a little bit to... How can I influence, you know, one of the best analogies is I could write you a world-class session. You can come in, I could have on the board, you know, you're going to do this exercise, you're going to do this many reps because it's backed by this evidence and this is how we're going to improve your rate of force development. But if that doesn't motivate you or that doesn't inspire you or the interaction I have with you as a coach isn't great, that coach-athlete relationship, is it really a world-class session? Because you might think, oh, I can't be bothered with that. Mm -hmm. Or I'll, I'll just do a little bit. You know, so yeah. The, yeah. there's so much more involved. And, and that's what's kind of led me on to taking a bit of a wider view, if you like, uh, and, and looking from where I'm, I'm now okay. viewing. Okay. So <laughs> I, we nearly got into a separate conversation there. <laughs> I wanted to use what you just said as an example. Um, of how to demonstrate the, t the, the technique of affirming. Okay. Um, but I'm actually more interested in your PhD <laughs> explaining this now. But I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'm just going to ask you, if I say a few things, right, yeah. um, you, you tell me if you just say yeah or no, if you think this is, this is applied to you. So after you s explaining that all to me, I'd maybe, to build your confidence, I'd maybe just state a fact and reflect back to you what I'm hearing that represents maybe a strength, a skill, or a value that you might have. So I just, very simple, you tell me if any of these land. So you're very curious and open to new ideas. Yes. Yeah, okay. Now, what about um, you were prepared to look beyond your current uh, understanding, um, and that shows that you know, you're humble I, I would like to think humility is a, a good trait that I have. Yeah, well, no, no one ever says yes to humble because <laughs> it <laughs> right. be humble, but yeah, that's obviously landed. Um, but uh, let me think. You, you're, you're driven to actually make a good job of this because you can see the difference it'll make to other people, and that's actually uh, what's important to you is how you can help others. I, I would say yes to that, but is that not the case for every coach? Uh, no, I wouldn't necessarily say so. There's definitely some coaches out there who have a narcissistic bent on them and uh, are doing it for their own accolades and, and stuff. 
So no, I wouldn't say that. But you notice every time I said something, you said yes after it. You agreed. But, and and if I highlighted a skill like openness and, and, and new things um, and being curious, I can then go like, okay, you're now feeling good about that. And you're now thinking, right, okay, I am open. I am curious. That means I can go into this other situation and be open and curious. And I can come back to you and say, you know, you're open and curious during your PhD. Why can you not be open and curious whenever you're down at the restaurant and, and we're exploring different types of seafood, you know? Um, so it's it's kind of like bringing that same uh, skill and, and, and value or, or strength and then applying it to a different place. Um, and that's what you would do throughout like a therapy conversation, motivational interview, you'd identify strengths in somebody and then help them apply those strengths in other areas. Um, but that again, the, when we're talking about verbal persuasion, this is a very high high level. I've maybe gone into too high a level um, of verbal persuasion by using a therapy. Other verbal persuasion, I'm sure you know, is obviously uh, shouting encouragement, um, people doing self-talk to themselves as well, and, and saying something to themselves that gets them to increase their confidence. But I think like, there's even research within S and C on the effect of swearing in uh, rate of force measurement within uh, force plates. You know, the swearing actually increases force production and strength ex expression, um, as does even sh sharing with them the previous attempts, uh, the, as in the numbers that are put out in the force plate. Like th those types of things are quite interesting because again, that's a form, I suppose, of um, verbal persuasion. It's like here's your past numbers. You know, do better. So verbal persuasion is something that is part of Banjura's um, theory as well. And the last one that is interesting is physiological feedback from Banjura. And I'll just quickly cover that because what that is, is does your physiological state indicate to you that you're stressed or excited? Um, and if I go and what's your best squat, Kevin? Uh, ooh, when I was, when I was a young lad, Probably 170. Right. So if I put you in under the bar at, you know, 160, you'll be excited and it'll be on the edge and that's close enough. And okay, big squat, right? But if I put you in the bar at what, 200, it's <laughs> yeah. excitement, you feel it's fear, you know, that, that that's too big a jump. Um, and again, it's kind of, those are two different emotions, um, but they're both the exact same in the sense that they're both adrenaline being dumped into your body. They're both causing this butterfly effect of, of the blood going out of your stomach um, and going to your muscles. They're both increasing your heart rate, increasing um, nerve excitement, and increasing your body temperature and whatever else. So the only difference is how you actually perceive it is the is the cognitive thought of this is a challenge or this is a threat. And then that is what makes you more or less confident or more or less confident. So I often explain this, I, I get people to watch, or first of all, I'll say, I want you to write down um, all the things you feel, you know, at Christmas or whenever you're really excited. So what happens at Christmas is people are, you know, oh, we're going to be opening up presents when they're a kid. They're, they may be a bit jittery. They're excited. Their heart's going. And you've got that, that, all those different physiological feelings. And then I'll put on the TV uh, or on the screen, I'll play a clip of a guy doing a backflip on a bridge, uh, or sorry, on, a, on the pier of a bridge. So like the big thing that goes up the middle uh, the, the, where the suspension cables come out of. Like he's at the very top of that doing a backflip. I think his name is James King. And you watch this video and I felt physically sick the first time I watched it because he does a backflip and he, you know, he's going to fall over. Uh, and it's just like, he's so close to the edge of actually dying with no safety. And that those same physical feelings were actually the same feelings of excitement, just you feel the danger. Mm. Um, so the point being that physical, the physical symptoms of excitement versus um, fear or anxiousness are the exact same symptoms. It's how you think about it. So the physical state is important and that will influence your, your level of confidence. Um, so that's Banjuri's theory in a nutshell. Um, yeah. So I don't know 
you mentioned something else as well, did you? Uh, no, I, there's, a, there's a couple of points there that I'd like to kind of pick up on, if, if that's okay. So you've kind of talked about that yeah. sensory experience, the kind of visual, auditory. So within the environments that the listeners operate in, you know, they might use a certain language for a team talk. They might often use highlight reels of past performances. Is is there a kind of preferred methodology to try and develop these routines? You know, is it visual? Is it looking at that highlight reel when I, I beat someone or I scored the goal? Or is it actual, you know, a, a lot of teams, a lot of individuals you see pre-performance will have headphones on or, you know, I work in a rugby environment, so we've got a loudspeaker on and, and someone's in charge of a playlist and, you know, the music builds the closer you get to kick off. I'm sure everyone's had that experience. So is 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 there a preferred method, like the visual or, or the order to kind of really cement these routines? Yeah, uh, there is. Um, so the preferred method is the one that works. And <laughs> that, that, that sounds sounds a bit uh, bit dodgy, but no, it's it's true because what I've just stated in, in the previous bit about Banjo's theory is how somebody perceives something. Uh, and this even also overlaps with uh, Lazarus and Folkman's theory of threat appraisal. You know, you might look at a wolf and go, that's that's a threat, I'm gonna get eaten, you know, if they're a hunter. So is it a threat or is it is it a is it a challenge? Is an appraisal that an individual makes? So you need to know what how does that individual perceive the situation? So if you know the visual things that you're putting up work for them what's their perception of it maybe like i didn't like that game okay i beat that guy i scored that try but actually that was a game where i got injured and i did my acl in the last five minutes i don't like that game so it's not necessarily about the visual it's not necessarily about uh the auditory it's not necessarily about you know is it music or is it this it's that it's the individual's perception of what it is you're playing and that's why what's really underrated uh, in a lot of professions is just having those conversations of look here what do you want you know it, it's not for me the psychologist to go in um, and say we're going to do it this way because the research says this well research says this about you know a big population of 100 people but what if you're the one person that's like way out here mm -hmm. you know or what if your team's got a slightly different culture what if your team is like very stoic and very calm and, and then you come in and say well, i want to I want to get my team up and get them excited. Why? Is that how they played their best game? You know, so that that's a good way to frame frame that. And from a psych perspective, that's what I do. My job is to have a conversation and to understand. And then it's to try and do the same with the coaches, same with the players, same with all the players and go, right, okay, we all think these things, but none of us agree in this thing and create that shared mental model. Mm. And again, shared mental model is a psych term for everybody think, thinking the same. And again, if you've got a shared mental model, you understand uh, each other, but that means that you've got a better uh, outcome and, and performance. So that's, to me, that's why I'm saying like, we do what works is the optimal thing, but it's the how, the process of finding out what works and what works for everyone, especially in that team environment. Because, you know, in a team environment, you're going to be sat there going, you know, Johnny needs a slap in the face to get him up for the game, right? But Steve, Steve needs to be left alone. He just wants to sit in the corner and be quiet. And he comes out like a raging bull. Well, I don't know what he says to himself, but he sits in the corner and goes into a dark place and then comes out and it's brilliant. But you're not going to go up and slap him in the face because that's not what works for him. So it's about where do the individual approaches meld with the team approach and discussing what works for everyone. And that's, that's the actual applied approach to doing something like this. Um, so it's not about one specific thing or and even if the evidence there was evidence to say you know audio or visual things are most impactful that's that's still not good enough for us not to do the applied the applied uh where this it's interesting though, there's, from a coach perspective i just want to touch on this people talk about audio visual learners kinesthetic learners and um i think there's another one as well 
the, the idea that people have learning styles mm -hmm. uh, is a complete myth. Um, and the reason we know this is because if you think of people who are blind, right, or who have gone blind through accident, if they were a visual learner, that would mean that they could no longer learn anything because they've had their, you know, they've had their main source of learning removed. Like that's the most simplest way to think of this. Yeah. So people assume that there's visual and auditory kinesthetic um, and visual and auditory kinesthetic is another one, a fourth one, I think. Yeah, that, um, that people have specific ways that they learn. And, and actually that's not true because we learn best through the medium that we're using. So if I'm if I'm doing music, it's going to be about, you know, how it sounds. If I'm doing baking, it's going to be how it feels when I fold the dough. If I'm doing uh, gymnastic, it's it's going to be again kinesthetic, how it feels when I'm doing it, and maybe visual as well. So the senses that needed for the task are the ones that are needed to learn the task. That's what's important. Um, so I think it's again a common myth in, in coaching psychology. Um, and, and it's basically pseudo pseudoscience. Sorry so, if I've dispelled any myths for your listeners that they rely on. No, no I think that's a good one because as we probably started the, the conversation, I think that style of learning is an ingrained concept, isn't it? That it has been shown to be uh, a jingle jangle fallacy, which is a, uh, a a word or a, a term I'm going to get into every conversation possible from now on. Um, but it, it's something we, we cling to, isn't it? You know, we've got styles uh, of learning, and I'm sure some teachers still out there design their lesson plans around, right, we're going to do this activity, and it's going to be a visual, we're going to do this, and it's going to be kinesthetic. Well, yeah, it's funny you say that, because I was actually, I trained to be a, a teacher, um, and I failed. Um, I, I trained to be a, a primary school teacher and I failed it and found out I was dyslexic at 27. Um, but like when I was doing that PGC, um, they were teaching us about visual auditory kinesthetic learners and they also taught us NLP as well. Um, so, and that was like today's, today's teachers in 2011. So it's only eight years ago and that was still being taught at that level. And I don't think there's any reason to think that it would not be still be taught mm. so um there's definitely teaching there's lots of myths within education and the teaching system um brain gym i don't know if you've heard of those things as well there's like ideas that um certain physical activities enhance your mental capacity and, mm. and it's not it's just like actually doing physical activity is is a useful break for kids and helps them um learn better there was even research saying that kids should have water um, in class and be able to have water breaks because it helps them learn and it wasn't the water it was the fact they were getting a break from yeah. their work <laughs> you know it was the fact they get they're like oh, i need a break and they're self-regulating they're going ah oh, i need a break from this is tough I'm going to go over and get some water in the classroom and then they they, they learn better it's because they know they're the goose and they need to get up and take a rest so they they mosey on over to the water station and hang out there for a bit and then come back so i think it's always important to think what is the actual cause and effect of, of these learning interventions that come into the coaching or education psychology. Um, I think we've gone off topic here. I don't know where we're yes. going, Kevin. I, I'm going to bring well, I'm going to try and bring it back because we've talked about coaching and arguably coaching is a form of teaching. So if we've got coaches listening now and they're looking to kind of build this pre-performance routine, what is the focus? Is it the objective performance? So, right, Hugh, I want you to think back to the last game where you made 10 passes, 100% completion rate, or you jumped 55 centimetres in your counter movement jump. Or is it the process itself? Right, Hugh, remember last game, brilliant performance. That's because you had nine hours sleep. That's because you had a really uh, good breakfast. Your nutrition was on point that day. So when we're creating these routines and these focuses, is it the objective that I actually put my finger on, you had five shots at goal and you scored a hat trick, Or is it the, the process? Can you remember you had a really good night's sleep, you had a yoga practice in the morning to help you kind of just um, ground yourself and, and relax? What is the focus? So... 
there's two, there's two two things from a site perspective and an academic perspective. The pre-performance routine is something that occurs in the minutes beforehand, uh, before an event, um, and generally it's it's researched within a, a self-paced single event. Um, but we can extend that into um, a, a game as well. You know, a pre-performance routine before a game. And it's slightly different from a ritual. Um, so people have lucky socks. Um, and that's that's actually a bad thing to have if you've got lucky socks. Because what happens in the day when you don't have those socks is your entire performance, you know, um, d- down the drain because you don't have those socks. So we don't want rituals. We want actually things that get us ready, which are in 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 control. And there's two, two people who've researched this. And one is... Uh, singer and the other one the name escapes me but there's two different models that I've looked at in terms of pre-performance routines and generally pre-performance routine is a sequence of things that lead up to before the event and they may incur it may uh, involve uh, physical arousal so getting yourself physically aroused as in psyched up a bit and getting yourself uh, mentally um, backed up, so there might be some self-talk involved, and then there might be also some imagery as well, um, and that that is going to be you then going over whatever it is you're about to execute, and then there's going to be the execution of the action, and then a successful review. So you kind of think about this as like physic- physically aroused and physical readying is the other one. So from a weightlifting perspective, because I'm familiar with that, now I'm going to go up and do a snatch. What do I do? I, I go to the platform, um, chop my hands. So that's normal procedure. And then from that point, I'm probably thinking, uh, right, I need to get into position, but I need to approach the bar confidently. So I probably physically stick my chest out like that before I go down. You know, I'm like, I'm squaring up to the bar. I stick my chest up uh, and I stand as tall as I can. And then I get myself, I give my hands a bit of a shake maybe. Because I'm like, right, these, these are my hands. I know where they are. I'm getting proprioceptive feedback. And then I'm going to connect with the bar. I'm going to connect with the bar. I'm squeezing my hand. I'm twisting it a bit to just really connect with it and feel it. And then once I've connected my hands and I'm physically ready, then I'm thinking, right, okay, get into position. And once I've got my back in position, I've got that isometric contraction in my back. Okay, I'm still, I still haven't done the lift yet. I'm just moving about and physically feeling that. And then before I lift... I'm probably going to do some sort of image of like, right, what do I think I want? What do I want to think of? I'm going to think, right, I, just, I want to think of maybe one cue. It might be drive the feet foot through the floor. It might be throw the bar above my head. You know, whatever the cue is that works for you. Uh, and I might have an image about that. And then I'm going to execute. And that's kind of the process. So there's like physical readying. There's maybe some self-talk. There's maybe some imagery in there. And what we know is that even if we look at rugby, for example, Johnny Wilkinson's uh, example of a pre-performance routine is obviously very famous with the, you know, his hands uh, interlocked and bent over before he does a kick, and it's, it's so precise and the same. And what we actually know is the harder the kick, the longer the length of time the pre-performance routine takes. The bigger the lift, the longer the length, length of time the pre-performance routine takes. So it's nearly as if these pre-performance routines are like the physical preparation um, on a mental preparation for getting ready for to perform at, at a level. So there's, there's some sort of pressure response to that in that the bigger the task, the more preparation we need. But the other thing you've kind of mentioned is like the self-awareness of what, what brings you to the competition, what brings you to the weight room in a good, good, uh, good state that you can actually put, you know, put in a good effort. And like you mentioned sleep the night before, food, things like that. And again, that's another separate thing. So like, that's not a pre-performance routine. That's just preparation and self-awareness. Um, and again, I, I would look at this like sleep. You mentioned is an interesting one because sleep doesn't affect one night of bad sleep doesn't affect an endurance athlete. Or sorry, doesn't inf- affect a strength or speed athlete's performance, but it does affect an endurance athlete's performance. And also, there's uh, research whereby people have had good night's sleep and they split them into a group and said, you've all had a bad night's sleep, you've all had a good night's sleep, even though they all had a good night's sleep. 
And the people who perceived themselves as having a bad night's sleep actually performed worse, worse in tasks. So again, it comes down to how you perceive your sleep is more important than the quality of the sleep. At times, obviously, we can't take that, that those words to extremes. Um, so I think there's a degree of, from an applied perspective, you would ask people, right, your best training session, what do you do the day beforehand? What means that allows you to bring it right? What do you do the five minutes before you walk into the gym? And then what do you do in the, in, in the gym in between sets? And then also, okay, you've done a, an attempt at something and it's gone crap. How do you reset and refocus? Because again, that's another part of actually having a good performance is reset and refocus. People always think, say things that are silly, like be positive. What does that mean? Like that, that's, that's waffle. So really what you, what you want to say is what's helpful? Is it helpful for you to get angry and cry and punch the wall and kick the crap out of the bin? Maybe it is. Maybe that all that negativity, rage and anger is actually really uh, helpful for you to express strength. So you have to ask yourself not what's positive, but what's helpful. Um, and that's a much more powerful question mm -hmm. than telling somebody to be positive. Like, just is your routine helpful? Um, how could you make it more helpful? So use the terms helpful and un unhelpful. Never use the terms positive and negative, even though we slip out. Like, I slip out with them all the time. But, you know, we want to focus on what's helpful because there is a research, again, by Gabriel Adigen about how negatively preparing for the negative things or the things that might set us back is going to enha enhance our performance. Um, so if you prepare for the worst, then hope for the best is kind of, you know, it's a, it's a maxim or a, a, what's the word, a common phrase, but there's actually research on it and it's called mental contrasting with implementation intentions from a psych perspective. So for whatever reason, people in psychology seem to study um, common sense and turn it into words that aren't marketable <laughs> like common sense. So that's something to consider. <laughs> that's very good. Uh, but Definitely, that that word helpful, unhelpful, is a, is a key phrase. I think so. You talked about that time frame. So I'm now a coach, and I've let my athletes prepare. They would, as they would as an individual on a game day. It's ten minutes before kickoff, um, or whatever term is used within your sport, and I come in and I deliver that Hollywood speech. Am I being helpful in my athlete's process because I'm taking away the, or I'm distracting them from their own focus? Or is that is that being helpful? Is it, is it refocusing anything? Because Hollywood do it great. Everyone's bouncing off the walls and runs through the door. But from what you've just said, is, is that an unhelpful thing because I'm distracting them from their own focus? Hmm. You know, it's 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 hard to. I can't place the judgment on on the context. I can only tell you what happened after the event. Um, and I know, like, you know, I know there's people who've done these things, and it's come off come off really badly because they, they made one or two small mistakes. And I think it's. I think it's interesting as well. So I know, and I know a coach who basically went and got pictures of everyone's family, and uh, so this is before, like this was in uh, Gaelic football. A friend of mine played for a team. He told me, but this is like the guy went and got a picture of everyone's family, and then put it, put them on the, all in the envelopes and handed out the envelopes before the big game. And then said, uh, right, lads, open up your envelopes. And everybody opens up to the envelopes. And there's the picture of the family. And, and he says, that's why you're, that's what you're playing for today. That's, you know, and, and my friend sort of reflected on it. He said, like, he was nearly in tears, you know, because, like, you know, this big emotional thing. But then that's like, whoa. <sighs> okay, you feel emotion and you feel it strongly. And, you know, you're all aroused. But are you performing? That's the question. Does it enhance performance? Not, you know, does it feel good? You know, if you feel like crap, but you do the best performance ever, you did the best performance ever. And I think we need to get away from this idea that performance uh, comes from a good feeling. Yes, it helps. 
But the best performers go out and set records when they feel like crap. That's that's the kind of thing that needs challenged a bit, I think. And I think the other aspect of that is, you know, that was quite a big and emotive way to evoke uh, an emotional reaction for a team and you know, bring people together and get them to fight. And this is a small parish um, Gaelic football club and, and it's set up in a parochial system in, in Ireland. Um, so it is, you know, appropriate maybe to do that. And it's probably similar to rugby, small rugby clubs, you know, um, with people's fathers and sons playing for the same team in, in areas, you know, down through the ages. But I think the other aspect of that is what if you go too far? You know, it's an inverted U, isn't it? You mm-hmm. know, if we get too emotionally aroused, um, you know, your performance might go way off the other end. Or what if, you know, you said something that causes somebody to think about something that's different? So I think if I was going to give advice to somebody who's going to give a, a halftime speech um, and a Hollywood speech, it would be, what are the what are the strengths that the guys have displayed in the first half? Build on that. It's like, you did this well, and I just need you to do it, keep doing it. You did that, that well. And then I would also relate it back to Gabriel Origin's work. It's like, we're going to make mistakes, but if you get them thinking about the process, but I don't care about the mistakes, I care about how you play. I care about do you get back up afterwards and go again? Because that's what we're going to judge ourselves by. So I think from a point of view is, if I was to try and craft the perfect halftime speech, it would be like focus on the strengths, focus on the process of what you expect them to do. Judge, tell people that they're going to be judged by that, not by the outcome of the game. Um, I think that would be a sound way to do it. But I think at the same time, who who are you to be given that speech? Like if I walk into your team, um, so again, I played for a team and we, we had uh, a guy who was a renowned player of, of, of Harding um, come up and coach us a couple of times. And then he actually phoned us up in the, and was put on to the loudspeaker in the changing rooms and gave us this big roaring speech. And, we kind of thought like, right, okay, he's won a few All-Irelands and an All-Star and whatever else. We're playing second division, Hurling. <laughs> Do you know, it did that, did, and he's not from our club. You know, it's kind of the same as Eric Cantona ringing up the local under, under fives. And I, don't get me wrong, it was a nice gesture that the manager had arranged and, and done this. But like, I, I just kind of thought like, who's the, is it his position right there? You know, and that was reflected on by the manager with me after the game. It was like, you know, I don't know if I landed or not. I don't know if it was right because he's not important. Our manager was important. The outside guy is not important because our manager was part of the team. So your status is something that you need to consider. Like, and I think, again, that's going to change. Um, that's going to change as well throughout your time managing and being a coach with somebody. So there's another good example of, Brian Corcoran, uh, again, another famous hurler, who talks about how the the coach was actually a priest or a bishop, I think. Um, and you know, Brian Corcoran's a legend of a hurler. But he talks about how when he was uh, in the middle of the, uh, the change rooms or whatever, the priest actually you know, said, lads, lads, do this for me, do this for me. And it was just like, it, it, who, who the hell was he to be anybody doing anything for him, you know? And it's kind of like you really have to consider what is the message you're putting out there and, and, and what does it consist of and who's in the room and what's your status in the room and all this sort of things, you know. So I think um, it's a dangerous ground, but simplicity and preparation will, will help you go far. Um, yeah. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Like, I mean, it's a big question. I can't answer it. Like, you've played rugby. You've worked in rugby clubs. What's been the best speech that you've heard and, and why was it good? That that is a really interesting question, and again, I don't know whether I can articulate any better than you have. I just remember um, listening to the the Johnny Wilkinson podcast um, when he was on High Performance, and he talks about how, as a group of individuals, they've talked as a, a playing group just to go through the process. Don't worry about the pressure. Um, just do what they've done. They've done it in training, so they're going to perform. And then 
the manager or the head coach comes in and says, we need to win this, you know, the pressure's on and everything. And it, it, he just said it just deflated the whole room. So it's, as you've said, and and encompassed the, the whole five W's of this podcast, what works for who and what context and why, I think it is about knowing your group, knowing your athlete, knowing that, that individual and, and what, allows them to respond in the way that you're looking for but I think as as coaches and, and I know I've done this myself many of times when I'm when I'm delivering that speech or I'm giving the hairdryer treatment it's about me or, and again this is my opinion and, and what I kind of understand it's about me maybe it's taking my own frustrations out because I'm not on the pitch and what I'm seeing is, is frustrating me because I know we're so much better than this or what if I was out there? So I think sometimes when kind of coaches go in there, it's their own self-perception of, well, I'm under pressure here and if we don't win this game, you know, people are going to, you know, it's the third game on a bounce, we haven't won. Am, am I under pressure? Right, I'm, I'm in the changing room. And again, this is one that hopefully many people can uh, understand you're in a changing room you just get this feeling you know the, there's an aura there's an air right this, it's going to be a good game today or the, there's been games where I've known half an hour before kickoff we're going to lose there's just not something there in the changing room is is that something or is that me just being pessimistic and then how how can I change that by giving an impassioned speech? Again, it's one of those unknowns, isn't it? So I think as you've rightly said, who are you as a person? Why are you delivering that speech? Is it because you know that group of athletes or that individual is going to respond in a certain way? Or is it best sometimes to just say, you know what, I'm going to take myself out of the equation as a coach because I've observed these group of athletes going through their own process and I'm not going to distract them from that. And I suppose that's when you get into the, the argument of art and science and nature of coaching, isn't it? Is coaching and art? Is it science? Is it nature? Is it all intermingled? I think uh, you've summed up that really well in the discussions we've had over the, the last hour or so. So uh, thank you so much for everything you've contributed this morning, Hugh, hopefully the listeners will have got a lot from that. I know I've certainly picked up a, a few things and, and jotted a few notes down as we've been talking, so I really appreciate you giving your time this morning. Not a problem. It's been a pleasure being asked on. Um, thank, thank you very much. It's always very humbling to think that somebody wants to <laughs> wants to know what you think. Um, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> it's uh, kind of like, what? Are you sure? Um, but uh, I think, you know, it's funny you say about... The, the speeches and, and things like that. I think the I think the one thing I will say is if, if you're a coach listening to this, don't worry. I guarantee you, uh, you probably haven't done it as badly as I have. So like, I've done these things as a coach and, and done things as a coach that I look back and now I'm going like, that was the worst ever. <laughs> My goodness, terrible, terrible. Don't ever do that. Um, so, you know, I think... If you're a coach going, yeah, I've made a few mistakes, that's good because, you know, you're, if you've made mistakes and you, you're regretting them, it means you're actually better than your mistakes. Um, so I think it's it's really important to support coaches because they are the lifeblood of sport. And, you know, there's so many volunteers out there that just need a hand. And I think it's just important to, like, support and thank all those volunteers that, that keep sport going. And um, it's very important. And people like yourself, Kevin, who are providing information um, to, to help people learn and, and develop their skills and, and give back to the communities is just excellent. So uh, fair play to you, Kevin, for what you do. No problem. Um, and again, I'm sure your PhD is going to be, it's, it's nice actually to hear somebody talk about PhD. We go, yeah, I understand everything you're talking about there because <laughs> it's applied. You know, that's class. So um, yeah, your professional doctor will be a great asset to people once you've uh, completed that. So best of luck with that. That's very kind of thing you say, and, and a great take-home message about that learning from coaches that actually we all make mistakes, but are we learning from them? Um, I think that's absolutely key.
Hopefully you enjoyed that discussion and the points raised by Hugh. What practices do you currently employ to deliver consistent performance? Are you now seeking to develop those processes following that conversation? And are you looking to build a daily routine that now emphasizes self-talk or mental imagery to aid your performance? If you did enjoy the discussion and want to develop a greater understanding of sports psychology, then check out Hugh's very own podcast, 80% Mental. If you're enjoying this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. Oh, 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 o